You may not think about where your energy comes from every time you flip a switch, but we do. At XL Energy, we're leading the energy future with a cleaner energy mix. We're national leaders in wind energy, and by 2021, we'll produce enough wind energy to power every home in Minnesota and Wisconsin. We're modernizing the way we deliver energy to ensure the reliability you've come to expect. We're delivering more options, providing tools to save energy and lower your bills. And when storms strike, we're offering more ways to keep you informed and connected. And we're going beyond energy. Investing to build strong, healthy communities. Helping our neighbors at home and across the country. Delivering low-cost energy so families and businesses have more money for their bottom line. Spurring economic growth and creating jobs that strengthen all of our communities. Because to us, energy is more than just poles and wires. It's about powering lives. XL Energy, leading the energy future for you. There's no additional charge for that video, by the way. Um, well, Sri, thanks for those nice comments. And it really is great to be back here today. Uh, I was here three years ago, and I had the honor to speak to probably many of you in this room. But I'm really excited today to talk to you about the progress we've made in just three years. And I'm going to talk to you a lot about this clean energy transition. But before I do, uh, I want to also extend my congratulations to the Carlson School of Management. Uh, you know, serving our community for 100 years turning out a lot of talent, some of which finds its way to Excel Energy. And we need more of that because we've got a, an exciting future ahead of us and we need talent to capture those opportunities. So thanks for all you do. Uh, we've been in the community for a little over 100 years now. And as Shree mentioned, we're headquartered in Minneapolis. Um, you probably know that. But we're also in eight states. You know, we like to say we're from the North Star to the Lone Star. So we're in Texas, we're in Colorado, we're in New Mexico, Wisconsin, the Dakotas. All in, we serve about 3.6 million electric customers and 2 million gas customers. And at Excel, we really focus on three things. Leading the clean energy transition, uh, enhancing the customer experience, making it easier to do business with us, and then keeping our bills low. We know how important that is. And, and a lot of times, those three priorities work together. Uh, and I think we're making good progress on all three fronts. But I'm really excited to talk to you today about the clean energy transition. I think we're developing plans that will significantly meet the risk of climate change, significantly reduce carbons while keeping our product affordable and reliable for everyone. So you might have saw back in December or read back in December our, our big announcement. We made the announcement back in December that we set a goal for ourselves to be 80% carbon reduction by 2030 and by 2050 to be completely carbon free. And that really is industry leading. And I will tell you, uh, I know that today we have the technology to get us to that 80% interim goal. And if the pace of technology is any indicator of the future, I'm very confident with the right public policy and the right approach, we can get to that 100% carbon-free goal by 2050 and keep our product affordable and reliable. So I'm really excited about that. I got asked after that uh, announcement, you know, what was the timing, what was your rationale, what was the thinking behind it? And I really would tell you it's multiple things. First of all, I think it's the right thing to do and we should do it. And our plan uh, aligns very nicely with the two degree scenario that uh, was set forth in the Paris targets. And it recognizes the importance of early action to addressing this risk. And it also recognizes that the electric utility sector can probably do more than other uh, industry sectors as far as carbon reduction. And that's an important point that we'll come back to in a little bit. So we should do it. And the great news is we can do it, and we can do it with economics in mind. You know, we have seen amazing advances in technology. Um, you know, when I was talking to you uh, three years ago, I was excited about the price of renewables. Well, since then, wind has come down almost 25%, and large-scale solar has come down a third. 
And I think that pace is going to continue, and that is making this an economic transition as well. As a matter of fact, these large-scale renewables actually can help customers save money. So we should do it. We can do it. And I think you want us to do it. Does anybody here, or let me just ask, if, if I can show you a plan where we can significantly reduce carbon emissions and keep your bills affordable and, and your, your energy reliable, show of hands, how many people would be interested in that? Who's not interested in that? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the reality is it's great to align with your communities, your customers, your regulators, and this is really an issue around climate change that unfortunately has become a political issue. And I will tell you, from my perspective, there's a lot of misinformation on both sides of this debate. But I just view it as a business risk that we need to mitigate. And it's not unlike the 80s, which I remember, some of you probably don't. Um, but the issue, the environmental issue of that dec decade, of course, was the depletion of the ozone layer. And back then, there was a lot of discussion whether we needed to do anything about it at all. Uh, the Reagan administration, to their credit, convinced the nation and then ultimately the world to take out an insurance policy in case the scientists were right. Well, it turned out the scientists were right, and I think it's the same scenario today. You can debate, in my mind, still debate how much man might be influencing climate, but to say there's no risk at all, well, I think that is a little bit foolish, particularly when we can take out a low-cost insurance policy against this risk. So that's what we're going to do, and I'm really proud where the future's going to go. But I'm also really excited about the progress we've already made. Since 2005, we've reduced carbon emissions by almost 40%. And while that's industry leading, our industry's not too far behind at 30% uh, carbon reduction. So we've done it in a number of different ways. Uh, voluntarily retiring coal plants is one way. Being a renewable leader is another way. We've been a renewable leader for over a decade now. Um, so I will tell you by 2020, another quiz for you, what do you think our biggest source of energy is going to be by just next year? Is it natural gas? Is it coal? Is it nuclear? It's renewables. Renewables will be our biggest source of energy across all of our eight states that we serve uh, by 2020. And by 2024, it'll be over 50%. So you combine renewables with moving away from coal and you can achieve some remarkable things. And again, I think we can do it at a great price for our customers. As we go forward, the one thing that I will tell you is we've got to make carbon reduction the number one priority. And I say that because renewables, as I mentioned, are going to play a huge part in carbon reduction, but they're not going to be the only part of the story. We're going to need other carbon-free resources as we move forward. So we've got to be agnostic about how we get there, because we should take the approach, affordability, reliability, never compromise them, and pick choices around that. And so if we stay disciplined and pragmatic, I think we can really achieve a lot of great things and do so at the prices that I think our customers want. Because if our product becomes expensive, then we're not going to be able to use our product to electrify other uh, parts of the of industry, which I think is important to the overall game plan. So how do we get there? Well, the first thing we do is if you don't consume energy, your footprint, carbon footprint is zero. So, you know, since the early 90s, we've had award-winning energy efficiency programs and it's helped kids, customers save money, but it's also helped us avoid about 20 medium-sized power plants. So that's a lot of energy that we didn't have to provide. And of course, technology's also just moved along at a, uh, an incredible pace. You know, your computers today, your, your appliances, your HVACs, your lighting, they are all tremendously more energy efficient than they were just 10 years ago. So that is really a big deal. So energy efficiency, probably don't talk about it enough, but it's an important part of this carbon-free journey. Of course, we're gonna need energy. And as I mentioned, we're the number one wind provider, we're the you know, largest renewable leader in the country, and we're gonna do more of that. But as I also would tell you, uh, just like we need to listen to our scientists on, on climate change, we need to listen to our engineers, and there's a few of them out in the audience I see here that I can call on if I get a tough question. Um, <laughs> it, we need to listen to our engineers when it comes to reliability and grid health. So we'll have more renewables on our grid than anybody else, but we're gonna need other things. And the first thing I would tell you is I wanna preserve our nuclear fleet. 
And as you probably know, nuclear is carbon free uh, and it's available 24 seven and we're running these plants better than we've ever run them in their, in their lives. So we wanna keep that in, in the, the uh, energy carbon free mix and we'll be talking with our regulators about that. I will also say it's a national issue. Uh, today, nuclear energy is about 20% of the energy's uh, source of power, but it's 55% of the carbon-free energy. So if we prematurely retire our coal plants, we're going to take two steps back on this carbon reduction journey before we can take a step forward. So I think that's a really important fact. You also see the picture on your screen here of natural gas. Now, I've got a goal of carbon-free by 2050, but that's 30-odd years away still. We're going to need natural gas to make this transition. And, you know, natural gas has already played a big part in moving away from coal. It has half the carbon content of coal. Natural gas plants are load following, so you can re uh, integrate more and more renewables with natural gas, and they bring some uh, grid health qualities that we need for a reliable grid. So if we're gonna move away from coal, we've gotta embrace natural gas, and I do want to move away from coal. Uh, I think that's really important that we do so. And in fact, we've been retiring coal plants. We've got two more coal plants in Becker, Minnesota that are gonna retire in the, in the mid-20s. And we're working with our regulators to see if we can't do even more. And that's here in the Midwest, and we're doing that across all of our other states. I will tell you though, while this is the right thing to do, it's pretty painful for the communities that experience the loss of, uh, of, of their revenue base and the economic development that comes with those plants in their backyard. And it's pretty painful for some of our employees too. So I think you've really got to do what you can, uh, all you can do to minimize that disruption. But on the employee side, we try to give our employees long lead times so they can be prepared for it. We're seeing a lot of retirements at Excel Energy. So the bottom line is uh, there's going to be a job for almost all of these folks uh, if, they're, if they still want a job at Excel Energy. And, and that's, that's helping minimize some of the pain our employees feel. And they're, quite frankly, very proud of what they accomplished. You know, coal plants have uh, driven the economy for you know, 75 years, but things change. On the community side, uh, we work really hard to minimize that disruption. A great example is right here in Becker, Minnesota, where we're closing two coal plants. We're gonna build the replacement generation on site in Becker using the existing infrastructure, that's gonna give them some more tax base. And we pledged to the city that we would work extra hard on economic development. In fact, we relocated Northern Metals to Becker from Minneapolis. And you might've saw the announcement in the paper a couple weeks ago about the Google data centers coming to Becker, Minnesota. I mean, this is a big deal for us in that you know, they will bring a lot of economic development. It's, and I believe it's the first of multiple data centers that they will site in Becker. So they'll employ 50 people full time, but it'll probably employ 2,000 construction workers to build, the, to build the, uh, the data center. And then I think there'll be more after that. So pretty excited about what we can do when we work with communities to minimize the disruption. So where are we gonna be by 2030? This is the interim goal. Uh, we're going to have at least 60% of our energy mix coming from renewables, maybe up to 70%. That's where the reliability issues and things like that will have to be uh, worked through. I'm confident we can achieve that 80% carbon reduction. I'm confident we can do this at the pace of inflation or less. And I also believe that just like I talked about with the Google Data Center, I think we can create a competitive advantage for the citizens of Minnesota. A clean energy product can attract new businesses uh, to our state, and that's good for all of us. So that's where we're gonna be. It's a great plan, but like every good plan, there's challenges that come with it. Uh, and I do worry about making sure that our product stays affordable, stays reliable. Uh, today, our, our, our energy prices are more than 20% below the national average, but that can change. And we need to make sure that we never lose sight of that because if our product becomes unaffordable, uh, I think the clean energy transition gets slowed down considerably. And again, we don't get to apply that clean product to other sectors. You know, the, the term electrify everything comes into mind. On the reliability side, well, that's just a given. We depend on uh, reliable energy every single day. And, I'm, and a lot of people only think about their energy when they're paying the bill, but that means we're doing our job. Because I guarantee you, you do think about it when the lights are out. So we are investing in the grid, making it smarter, making it more capable of uh, integrating more and more renewables. 
Also, while we're making this investment, we're keeping a key eye on a risk that I didn't have to think about 10 or 15 years ago, and that's cybersecurity. And that is a really a big deal. Don't think the bad guys don't know that if they take the grid down, they take society down with it. So we're doing a lot of work on that. And again, I listen to my engineers. I challenge them. You know, we never thought we could integrate this much renewables onto the grid just 10, 15 years ago. We're learning how to do that through some sophisticated software, and we'll do more. But recognize that there are limits on how much you can have on the big grid for renewables. So we're going to need, we're going to need other zero carbon dispatchable resources. I'm happy to answer your questions about that. Well, all of this, all of this comes together with public policy. Has so anybody ever heard the old saying, you know, that a scientist will tell you what you uh, can do, an economist will tell you what you should do, and a politician will tell you what you will do? <laughs> I mean. We got to get the will do's consistent with the shoulds and the can'ts. And that's really important because if we go down uh, the wrong paths, if we support technologies that aren't the most efficient way to reduce our number one priority, carbon reduction, we're going to fail. And there are plenty of examples of poor public policy where we support things that aren't the most efficient way to get there. Scale does matter in our business. I'm a big believer that you should be able to choose if you want uh, renewables on your roof or what have you, but I don't think that other people should have to pay for it, particularly because that cost shift usually comes at the price of those that can afford it the least. Um, so we got to be careful with that. We got to get public policy right. Uh, we got to align with those goals. And we're going to need public policy to continue to reward and incent innovation. You know, I think some of the, the tax policies that have been out there to support renewables took a nascent industry and made it prime time. Well, we're going to need to also invest in the next generation of technology so we can get that last 20% of carbon reduction. And again, I'm agnostic about well, how we get there. I tend to think it might be the next generation of nuclear and small modular reactors which have passive safety uh, systems, but I don't know. Some of my team thinks it's carbon capture. We haven't had a lot of success with carbon capture, but there's a new technology coming out that has a lot of promise. Maybe it's breakthroughs in battery storage. Right now, battery storage tends to be four hours, which is great, but we have to plan for more than four hours. So maybe there'll be some long-term storage that comes out there, and we're looking at that. Things that I would have laughed about 15 years ago, something like the hydrogen economy, I don't laugh about that anymore. We're going to have a lot of carbon-free renewables at night that perhaps we could use to uh, make hydrogen and do something with that. So there's a lot of different technologies, but you know, if you, if you want to uh, have a shade tree, you've got to plant a seed. So we've got to work on that today so it'll be ready for us tomorrow. Well, when we get this cleaner product, think about what we can do with other sectors. Do you know what the biggest carbon emitter is in the United States now? It's not my industry. It's the transport industry. So there's a huge opportunity here. And if you have an electric vehicle today and you're charging that up with uh, Excel Energy, you're charging that up with, with the equivalent of a dollar uh, a gallon of gasoline. So that's a pretty good economic deal for you. Um, I will also tell you that today you would be reducing your carbon emissions by 70% over that gasoline product. By 2030, it's going to be 90 to 95 percent. And if we can get the capital cost of those EV cars down and the underlying infrastructure that goes with it, I think that's another economic transition that'll, that'll take place. And if you can knock out electric and transport, we've come a long way. The other sectors, quite frankly, can do stuff, but it's not going to be as dramatic, in my opinion, as what we can do. So at Excel Energy, we're really supportive of the, that transition. Uh, we've got pilot programs that we want to expand ultimately, which will make it easy for you to get an EV, get a home charger in your garage, and then give you a billing program that incents you to bill at night when we have plenty of power available, and so we all benefit from that. We're also working with cities and the Metro Transit uh, for the first uh, electric buses that should be out uh, later this year. So lots of exciting things happening there. Well, I want to get to your questions in a minute here, so I'll just go back on this goal. I, am, I believe that the utility industry is really prepared to work with everyone to achieve a, a, a carbon-free, 
carbon light, whatever, uh, whatever technology and economics tell us that it can be, I think we're there for you. And uh, it's not just Excel Energy. I speak for my whole industry. I'm really proud of what our industry can accomplish. You know, we pull together when the chips are down. And I think climate change is one of these things that we have to pull together on. But we always have pulled together on reliability. When those lights go out, when we have a bad storm in our backyard, we get help from other utilities. When they have a bad storm, we go help them. And uh, I had the opportunity about this time last year to go to Puerto Rico and see our crews uh, restoring the power in Puerto Rico. And they had been without power for months, not days. And it really was heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. And I thought I'd show you this video, and then I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. It was really interesting, the, uh, the men and women that were over there, they did, really didn't want to come back because the job wasn't completely done. Um, and we were literally at that point going, this was up in the hills, going to house by house. And the people kind of knew we were leaving too and they you know, really got anxious around it. And so our, our, our folks are, you know, they're not used to completely getting the job done. So it was pretty hard on them. Um, it was pretty, um, it's, it just shows you just how important something we, we take for granted it really is. And, you know, these people, I, I, they put up with a lot of misery. So we were glad we could help. Our trucks did get home, although they didn't get home in very good condition, I can tell you that. <laughs> it was kind of brutal. So listen, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts and any commentary. Yeah. I can yell. Down at the House, uh, down at the house and Senate where I testify, uh, most days. We've had a lot of discussion about the price of uh, the solar energy panels that were very high at one time. They're coming down much like the BCR did many, right. many years ago. Is that still the case? And I, th I would think that would be a, a great energy to go to in the, in the distant future. The, the, what, the price of solar panels, is that right. basically? Yeah, right. I mean, 10 years ago, large-scale solar was costing about $160 a unit. Today, even here in the upper Midwest, where you know it's it's not the sunniest place in the nation, it's costing about forty dollars. So you know that's a tremendous price point uh, cost reduction in just ten years. Now, it is subsidized to the former gentleman's comments by the federal government, but those subsidies are going away, and I'm convinced that the underlying technological improvements will very quickly have solar. Uh, overcome the lack of the federal subsidy that's available for it. And I think wind will be a little bit slower, but ultimately will settle down into some extraordinary prices. So just to put it in perspective, if I have a natural gas plant, if I can buy gas at $3 and blah, 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 it's going to cost me about $30 a unit to fire up that uh, plant on a variable basis. Today I'm buying wind at $20 a unit. So if I don't, I might need that gas plant for backup, but if, I, but if I can ha have the wind displace the natural gas, that's doing good for the environment and good for the pocketbook. And that's what we're trying to accomplish at Excel Energy. 
Yeah, absolutely. So right now, our nuclear plants, we have three units, um, and they are scheduled to retire in the uh, 2030s. Um, all of them, I think the last one is scheduled to retire in 2035. We've, we've been pre-funding the, the decommissioning cost all along, and you know that's, that's what all plants do. How it gets decommissioned is something that gets worked out with, uh, with the NRC as well as the state regulatory bodies. Now what's happening with First Energy Michael. is First Energy is selling those uh, nuclear plants into what's called organized markets. So it's not a regulated utility like we are. Uh, here in Minnesota, they're selling into markets, and those markets were designed, you know, when there were no re was no renewable energy essentially on the system. We had oil fire generation more than we'd had renewable energy, and the carbon-free value of that of that nuclear plant is not being recognized by the market. So you're seeing the premature shutdown of nuclear plants. And again, I think it's a, I think if we're serious about carbon change, we've got to really worry about that and, and hopefully do something about it. Okay. Um, in order to take advantage of the electrification of the transportation industry, there's going to have to be a pretty big capital, capital investment in charging stations. Can you comment a little bit about the size of that investment and maybe how you envision it would be made? Would it involve utilities? Would it involve non-utilities doing it? Give us some sense of that. Well, I think you're going to see the big uh, uh, petroleum companies get into it. I mean, Shell, uh, uh, for example, is buying some of these companies that are startups now but specialize in uh, public charging stations. So I think it's going to be a, a combination. I don't necessarily think we should be owning the charging station. I, obviously, we need to uh, develop the underlying infrastructure. And I think what we're going to need to do is, is have su some supercharging stations which right now are, you know, any of those that are out there are basically lost leaders. But if you don't have them out there, you're going to not address the, the range anxiety issue. And, you know, people don't want to wait eight hours for their, for their car to charge up if they're halfway to their destination. So I think we're going to have to just seed that. I mean, keep in mind, the, our transport industry has evolved over, you know, 100 plus years. So we're going to have to make some of these investments so that, um, you know, people will feel better about their EVs. Now, you know, if you're in a single family home, I, most of your charging is going to be done um, at home. And what we want to do, as I mentioned, is to encourage you through a discounted rate to charge at night when we do have excess power so we don't have to build any more power. And it's the best time for the grid for a lot of different reasons for you to do that. I think you'll also see a lot of charging um, at, at the workplace. And, you know, that needs to be developed. And then we're going to have to figure out how people that, you know, don't have a garage but want to have an EV and park their car on the street, how we can get there. So it's, it's going to be a series of steps, um, but I think it's going to happen a lot faster than I would have thought five years ago. Hi, uh, question for you. There's been a lot of talk over the last decade about the smart grid or hype, I don't know which. Um, <laughs> and I'm just curious, what that means to you, and I'm thinking particularly on the distribution side, what changes you see coming and kind of the why of it? What's the, what's the benefit for the, the grid or the consumer or, you know, where is this headed? Well, you're, you happen to be at the table with one of the smartest people in the industry on that same topic, but I will try to do her justice. Um, <laughs> only if I get stumped. <laughs> well, so smart grid to me is, means a couple different things. It first of all recognizes that for decades and decades, it's been we, we've, you've had one-way power flow, right? And and increasingly, as we do have distributed resources on the grid, now it's two-way power flow. So that, so we have to have the ability to understand what's happening on the grid to accommodate that. The second thing is, if we can understand what's happening on our grid because we have more data points, more monitoring on that grid, we can do a better job at redirecting energy flows, integrating more renewables, uh, understanding perhaps where we're starting to have a maintenance issue, so, and, and we can also have less waste um, uh, through uh, inefficient heat transfer on the grid. So um, it means all of those things. and and. And being able to communicate two ways, as well as accommodate two-way energy flows, is really the whole basic concept of the grid. The danger is, 
you know, every time you have two-way communication, there's, that's an entry point for you know, cyber hackers. So we have to be really, really careful and diligent with that. Did I do okay with that, Teresa? All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, back here. Uh, thank you so much for your coming in and doing this today. Uh, so I know this renewable energy transition is going to require a lot of investment, um, and Excel has a pretty sizable CapEx budget. Um, I'm curious, do you have a, a leverage target you'd be looking to maintain longer term? And to the extent that your uh, CapEx budget increases, would you be looking to fund that with debt or equity at this point? You're a finance guy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, I am too, at least a recovering one. Um, yeah, first of all, you want to, you we're solidly investment grade rated, and I think that's incredibly important. To your point, we're going to spend $20 billion over the next uh, 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 five years on, on a number of different things, including the clean energy transition. Uh, we, tend to, we tend to have an equity uh, ratio of about, you know, in the 50% range, um, and, and um, we periodically issue equity to make sure that our credit ratings stay strong. And, and uh, that's, that's the game plan. Go ahead. Hey, Ben. There's a lot going on in California, uh, climate-related, reliability, safety issues, et cetera. Um, as that story unfolds, what do you think can be the lessons learned for both state regulators and their interaction with federal regulators going forward to that? third point in your joke about uh, politicians saying will do. Well, just for the benefit of everybody in the room, uh, California uh, has some unusual, to say the least, laws. Uh, and there's been, as we know, a lot of wildfires in California. And the large utility there, PG&E, has actually filed bankruptcy. And it's, it's the second time, as you know, Scott, in the last 20 years they've done that. Um, it's energy policy gone wrong, but specifically what's happening there is that there is a strict liability law in California, which means even if you didn't do anything wrong, but if your lines cause the fire, you pay for everything. And it was meant to socialize this cost, um, but what's happened is that regulators aren't allowing the recovery. And, um, you know, these wildfires, um, you know, the, the estimated liability is like $35 billion. So they just couldn't cover it. Uh, PGE also had a, a tragic gas explosion uh, about uh, nine years ago, uh, and there's a lot of liability with that. So I can tell you, I take it very seriously. Public safety is absolutely the thing we can never lose track of, that and employee safety, quite frankly. Um, we don't have the same laws for wildfire, but we are going to, particularly in Colorado and parts of Texas, we are going to really double down and make sure that we're implementing best practices um, so that we can mitigate that wildfire risk. And, you know, the interesting thing there is, you know, there's almost a trade-off for reliability versus fire prevention. Because of the way we um, operate our system, you typically uh, will uh, reclose a breaker and that's because typically it's only a momentary outage, but it can have a fire risk associated with it. So in that very fire that PGE uh, uh, is now the, the cause of, they wanted to shut power down because of the wildfire risk, and they got so much pressure to keep you know, the power flowing that they did, and of course then a wildfire came. So it's a tough situation. We have time for one last question. Well, thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. It was very informative. But one of the things that uh, you hear a lot about is the detection of, uh, or the prevention of hackers being successful at attacking the grid. You don't hear much about the repercussions for the people that are caught. Could you speak to that a little bit? It seems that would be a good place to uh, uh, show how um, there are repercussions. Well, uh, thank you for that question. So uh, the problem is the, the, the people I most worry about, you know, isn't the kid in the basement. It's, it's the nation state actors. And so, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're not the government. So, you know, and we're not allowed to attack back. Um, and I don't think you want us attacking back. <laughs> <laughs> it's the role of the federal government. I mean, to, to uh, go after that. And, and it's a very serious issue. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know we, we do a couple of things. We're, you know, 
you know, we've done a really good job of, of doing more with less people at Excel Energy, but my uh, cybersecurity uh, team has grown enormously in the last five years, and I don't say no to anything they need. It's just too important. Um, but we also recognize, despite all our good efforts, something bad could happen. So we do a number of national drills as well as local drills to you know, try to understand all the moving parts and that sort of thing. And the thing that really is important and where I think we can do a better job of is, is coordination between not only our sector but all the critical infrastructures. So that would be, you know, like financial services, et cetera, because in this kind of emergency, they all will be commingled. And if we're not coordinated, um, we, won't get, we won't restore uh, the cyber attack or get, mitigate the cyber attack as quickly as we can. There are, there are also more that needs to be done at the governmental level. Um, I serve on the National Infrastructure Advisory Council, and so we, we've been making a series of recommendations to both the Obama administration and now the Trump administration on how we can coordinate these efforts better because we need to, because the bad guys aren't getting worse, they're getting better. Is that it? Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much.